Happy New Year, everyone. Hey, my name's Nate. I'm one of the pastors on staff at Peak City Church. I wanted to welcome you to Church Online this morning and just share one quick announcement with you. If you, if you were with us on Christmas Eve, you'll remember that we gave out little ornaments as reminders to bring in a gently used or a brand new coat to donate for our winter coat drive. We'll be receiving those coats this coming Sunday, January the 7th, when we gather back in person again at 9.15 or 11 o'clock a.m. at Apex High School. So let's get the year started off right by serving Jesus and blessing our community and those in need with a brand new or gently used winter coat. Let's all get our hearts ready to dive into worship and a time in the Word of God together. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Good morning, Peak City Church. Welcome. Let's stand up as we prepare to worship as we're able. We got a little bit of a different setup this morning for you. I think that we have some fun with it. Um, so we can worship in all the same ways we normally do and maybe some uh, some different ones that you haven't done before. You can um, clap, you can sing, you can jump around, you can sit, you can listen, you can cry. Um, but let's worship the Lord and go before him with confidence um, as we have been given permission by his sacrifice. Let's celebrate that today.
Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. So it's the beginning of, of Advent, well actually a little bit later in the week here, uh, this next approaching Sunday, but we're going to start celebrating Christmas today. Uh, this is the day where we come together, a lot of family, uh, maybe with you that might have been from out of town. We're, we're so thankful for you. We're celebrating our Thanksgiving weekend, and at the same time, we're reflecting now on the true source of where our hope lies and where our true thanks is, and that's in Jesus. Uh, and so we're going to sing a song about His coming. It's something familiar that we probably all know. Uh, let's worship God together as we do that. We're going to sing O Come Emmanuel. as we worship you today, as we sing of your coming, uh, we simply ask that you would just draw near to us uh, here today. We know that we're a people that, that desperately and deeply need you. And you are the key to all the hope that we could ever need, want. For those that don't know you, for those that do, for, for those of us that have received your gift of new life that only comes from you, you're the reason for our hope. So as we come before you now and worship, uh, Lord, I pray that you would hear us as we pray, that you do a work in our hearts that only you can do. 
Hey, as we're here today worshiping, we love to give an opportunity at Peak City where people can receive prayer. Uh, we are a, a, a church that simply believes that what the Bible says is true, that, uh, that he is a prayer answering God, that he can meet you at the point of your need, that when you've exhausted every human effort, Jesus is standing there just waiting, waiting for you to turn to him. Sometimes he's looking at us saying, why'd you wait so long? He wants to be the first place we look to. And so we want to invite you today, if you need prayer for any reason, just to come on down. We've got some folks from our prayer team. Pastor Austin's in here somewhere. He's going to come down. Um, and just, just so you can have an opportunity to receive prayer today as we worship in this next song. I think I see Deanna somewhere in the room. There she is. She's right now in front. Yeah. So if you'd like to receive prayer today for any reason, for you or for someone else, come do that. We're going to sing a new song today. And just uh, allow the Lord to speak to your heart as we worship together. And while we're singing, if somebody wants to come down to receive prayer, you go right ahead and do that. You tell the sun to rise every morning, colors the sky. With the shades of his glory Wakes us with mercy and love My Jesus died and He who holds the orphan And comforts the widow Cries for injustice Feels every sorrow Carries the pain of his children does. I believe that he does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Oh, praise to the Spirit who's given in us. When I was a sinner, he saved me from who I was. Cause that's what Jesus does. I believe that he does Who sings a song of sweet forgiveness Who stole the keys hell and the grave And who has the power to say That Jesus does Yes, he does So we sing praise to the Father
Hallelujah. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. We sing praise to the Spirit. He's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Yes, that's what Jesus does. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, we sing praise to your name. Praise to the Father, for you gave us your only Son. We sing praise to the Spirit, your Holy Spirit that's living in us. As we gather in your name, we sing praise to you because when we were running and running away from you, living life our own way, you redeemed us. You took that old spirit and put in a new one. You saved us from who we were, from who I was, God, you saved me. Something I, I, I could never earn or deserve. But you saved me because that's what you do. That's what Jesus does. So we praise you with our lips and our obedience. We dive into your word. We live in community and we show your love to one another in response to that. So God be glorified by all of that this morning. Every hand raised, every song sings, <laughs> every song sung, God would glorify you, bring honor to your name. And it's in that lovely name of Jesus, we say amen and amen, church. Praise come God, on. praise the Lord, praise God. So good. Christina's gonna come share some announcements with us this morning. Good morning, Peak City Church. How are y'all doing? Y'all talking a little slow. I think some of y'all are just sleeping off some turkey. <laughs> Everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah, yeah, awesome. Glad to hear that. Well, my name is Christina Matthews, and on behalf of Peak City Church, I just want to say welcome and let you know that we are so glad that you decided to spend part of your Sunday with us today. We love just gathering together as a church and being together. And if this is your first time, I just want to extend a special welcome to you and let you know that we're truly glad that you're here and know that you are our, our VIP guest today. And uh, make sure you stop by guest services on your way out. See my friend, either Janine or Rachel. We want to make sure that you get your free gift from us that just says thanks so much for checking us out and spending some time with us. But we'll go ahead and start running down the list. So we do two things every Sunday here at Peak City Church. First is we fill out a Connect card. There's going to be a QR code that pops up on the screen. Or when you walked in, you probably saw some physical ones. Just take a few moments, fill that out. Don't worry, you're going to get the hassle-free guarantee. We're not going to be spamming you or hitting you up. This is just the best way for you to connect with us and also lets us know how we can best serve you as a church, whether you're interested in anything that I mentioned in the announcements, or if you have any prayer requests, that is the best place to put those down. And the next thing that we do is check in on Facebook. So this is really awesome because it does a lot of cool things, one of which it lets people in the community know like, hey, there's an awesome Bible preaching local church that I can check out. And it actually helps us to be generous because for every Facebook check-in we have during a month, we donate $2 to an organization that's doing the most good either here locally in our community or even globally around the world. And lastly, if you miss anything that I said this morning, no worries, we have you covered. Go ahead and just subscribe to our church newsletter called The Weekly. Super easy to do. Just go to peakcity.church forward slash newsletter, and that will make sure that you are in touch and in tune with everything that we have going on. But again, guys, thank you so much for being with us, and you can go ahead and turn your attention to the screens.
Good morning, Peak City Church. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Who ate good? Who ate good? Uh, turkey or ham? Mm, or steak? I had steak. Ribeyes. For the win. Uh, my name is Austin Matthews. I am the next generation pastor here at Peak City Church. It means I'm invisible usually on Sunday mornings with the kids. I love it. I love my team. If you want to be part of the team, come on and join. You'll be part of one of the best, some of the best people imaginable around. They are fantastic, and the kids are so awesome. I would not say that about everyone's kids, but I truly believe your kids are pretty cool. So maybe I'm the only one, but, you know, I truly believe that. So um, also, I want to see a show of hands. Uh, who has already put up their tree? Anyone? Yeah, y'all are late. Me and my wife, we put it up in September. So, she, she loves Christmas, so I surprised her. So, shout out to her. I think she's somewhere in the back. But, um, man, there's a lot to be thankful for, isn't there? So much to be thankful for. I don't know if y'all had a, a chance to reflect as you were cooking literally every side in your household um, this week. But um, <laughs> some people, you know, you do the potluck, and then sometimes you, you just cook everything to make sure it's good, right? And I don't know if anyone was like that. But... Um, we have so much to be thankful for, um, and that is the topic of today. One thing to be thankful for is assurance of salvation. We're going to preach the gospel today. We're a gospel-believing church. We're a gospel-preaching church, and we want to share some good news with you today. If you're on board, would you say amen? amen. That's the thing we do here. Uh, if, if we could welcome everyone who's watching online, we are so glad you're here with us today. Thank you for joining us, and maybe my wife already said it, but let's welcome everyone who's a first-time guest today. We are so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. There's no greater joy than knowing you're saved and just being able to live in that victory and that truth. Alternatively, there's no greater despair than just wondering if I'm saved and not knowing where you're headed. Some people have made their peace, but I want to talk especially to you today if you're wondering if I'm saved, if you're wondering what that even means. If you think you're a Christian and pretty sure you're a Christian, but don't know what judgment day is going to look like, this is not going to be a hard message. This is going to be one of encouragement. I want to encourage you today. I want to challenge us to believe in the good news that God has set out for us. He isn't looking down to condemn us. He has sent his son in love. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that when we lack assurance, we lack joy. And I believe that. I've gone through that. I have doubted uh, my faith. I have doubted whether I'm saved, and that has robbed me. I have robbed myself of the joy of living in the spirit. So today, let's correct that. I pray that everyone walks out of these doors much surer of where you're headed. And I want everyone to know, everyone under the sound of my voice, you can have assurance that you are saved by God in Jesus Christ. You can know it. Not just think it and be like, ah, oh, that'd be a good thought. You can know it today. The title of this message is The Assurance Test. The Assurance Test. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to your sight. Amen. As we've done through this beautiful series called Vital Signs, love that title, um, we are walking through line by line 1 John. And today we're going to walk through 1 John 5, 1 through 13. That'll be the first half, and then I want to encourage us and challenge us in the second half. Are y'all ready? All right. I don't know. Are y'all ready? All right. Uh, say believe. believe. Say believe again. Believe. Verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. This is why Christians are called born again. Everyone is created by God. There's no doubt about that. The question is, are you a child of God? 
Just because you're created by God does not mean that you know God as your father, as your savior, as your friend. Just because you're created by God means that you can enjoy life here and now, but does it mean that you will enjoy life with him forever? God's children know that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we just singed about. I love that song. If this is true for you, then you and I can say along with the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. That's Galatians 2.20. Verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and when we obey his commandments. When some of us think about commandments, we might think about the Ten Commandments, even if you don't know what those are. It sounds like those would apply here. And I think they do. You can't love God. And here John's talking about other Christians. If you're a Christian, you can't love other Christians. You can't love anybody else if you lust after them. You can't love them if you lie to them. You can't love them if you cheat on them or if you cheat them or if you want what they have and you covet it in your heart and you desire it for your own. You can't love somebody. What am I missing? If you don't honor them. If you rob them of the honor, let's just even say your parents, of the honor that they are due. You can't love them also, as Jesus makes so abundantly clear, if you are withholding forgiveness from somebody, no matter what they've done. If you walk with Christ, you should know that Christ forgave you of everything you have done. Amen? Do not withhold forgiveness. Love is the main commandment. Love And love is defined by following what Jesus has affirmed in the Old Testament and what he has taught us while he was ministering. Love. Verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Praise God. Everyone here has faith in something. And I think of faith like a vehicle. At least that's how I'm going to illustrate it today. Faith is like a vehicle. It is driving you to a very specific destination. If you place your faith in yourself, then you're driving off the cliff. But if you place your faith in God, the God of the Bible, in Jesus Christ, you are headed for the kingdom. But listen here. Your faith in God vehicle, I'm just going to call her Old Faithful, just for short, Old Faithful runs on something very specific. She runs on love. A lot of us live like we've got to obey God and it's out of duty. But do not run your love vehicle on duty. Do not run Old Faithful on duty. It stinks, y'all. Run her on love. Fuel up by spending time with Jesus. Pray. Read your Bible. Do all the things that every preacher always talks about, but you're just like, ah, I'm looking for something more spiritual. Pray. Talk to him daily. Set aside 15 minutes in in your morning. Wake up a little earlier. Spend some time with him. Read your Bible. Do life with people of faith. Join a city group. Serve those in need. Spend time with Jesus. When you draw from the well, the well never runs dry if you're going to Jesus. And then you can run your faith on love. And when you run on love, obedience will not feel like an obligation. As it was for Jacob when he worked for seven years and then seven years again for Rachel to win her as his wife, it felt like a few days because he loved her. In the same way, those who love God never feel like Obeying him is work. It feels so worth it. It feels like a privilege, not an obligation. Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I like Adidas. I just bought some Adidas shoes like two days ago. 
Adidas fits my feet. I love the stripes. I think Nike is sometimes a little overpriced. And man, honestly, the Adidas I just bought feel just as good as on clouds. Don't at me. But Adidas is great, but Nike, together with Air Jordan, a subsidiary of Nike, they own 30% of the global shoe market, which is insane. They're just doing victory laps in their Air Force Ones, those higher-ups. Nike, the company, gets its name from a Greek word that looks like Nike, but it's pronounced Nike. Everyone say Nike with me. Nike. Nike. If you bought Nikes, they're going to wear out. Anyway, Nike means victory. The victory, John says, the victory, the overcoming of the world is your faith. It is living by faith. It's not just believing in doctrine, right, and then never having anything to do with God. It's living by faith. It's not knowing the Bible. It's living the Bible. It's not knowing about God. It's knowing Him because you're living in relationship with Him. How well do you know someone if you never spend time with them? Living by faith is living from victory because at the cross, Jesus won the decisive battle that will win the war. There's no question. The battle is won. The daily decision of faith then, when you choose faith, when you live by faith, it is a decision to win. Who wakes up and decides to lose? I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. Don't you want to win in life? It doesn't mean you're going to have the successes you think you might have. It means that you live from victory. It means that old faithful doesn't have to be a race car zooming to the finish line. She's already running laps around the devil. You just got to keep her fueled up and going. She can chug. It's okay. It's okay. And she doesn't run on duty, right? She runs on love. Our faith was gifted to us by God who loves us. And by God, we've got to run on love if we're going to finish the race with joy. Amen. Verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? It's a question. And the answer is very simple. Nobody. Only saints go marching in. But saints aren't the 1% of the 1% of the 1% who serve in orphanages and who take vows of poverty and who take vows of silence and who live in monasteries. Those aren't the saints. Some of them are still sinners. Saints, thank God, are just you and me if you and I are in Christ. We're not saints by what we do. You'll hear this a few times in this message. We're not saints by how good we look and how well we live. We're saints if we're in Christ. Saints go marching in. And saints fix their eyes on Jesus, who is the subject of the next verse, verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood. Sounds cool. Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood in the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. This might sound a little above our heads, a little like, what is John saying? What is the water? What is the blood? What is the Spirit? We'll get into it. What John is saying is that Jesus was flesh and blood when he was born of the Virgin Mary. This is what we celebrate in Christmas, y'all. The Son of God became one of us, not as some like weird spirit baby, but as a flesh and blood baby boy. And when he began his ministry, this flesh and blood, now 30-year-old man, was baptized in water. He started his ministry through water. And when he was baptized in that water, when he raised up, Mark says immediately, it's his favorite word, Mark says immediately, when John rises out of the water, the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven comes and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I love Christmas songs. Not all of them. Oh my gosh, not all of them. But I love <laughs> Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I don't always think about angels swirling around my head, but the lyrics to this are powerful. 
In the second verse, we sing, Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, and born to give them second birth. That is the gospel. We're singing Christmas carols, y'all, and it's fun, but it is the gospel. It is good news. It is stuff that we could not make up, and it is too good, too good not to believe. He was born to give second birth. The Son of God was born as a human to give us sinful humans second birth as children of God. It is beautiful. And he or she who is born of God overcomes the world. Verses 7 and 8. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. I'm going to come back to this later, talking about the water and the Spirit and the blood. But in the Old Testament, and I think according to common sense, if someone gives a testimony or an alibi in court, you want a couple different witnesses to hold that up? You want two or three, is what the Old Testament says in law that you should have. And here we have not just two, but three witnesses that agree that Jesus is fully man and also that he is fully God. He's not 50-50. He's 100%, 100%. It's important. We're going to move on. Verses 9 and 10. If we receive the testimony of men, meaning that if we believe what other people tell us, The testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son, that whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The testimony we receive, to put it plainly, is the gospel. It is the good news. It is the good news that despite our weak, rebellious, sinful, godless lifestyles, God never abandons you. Verse 10. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. It is not only unwise to question God's witness concerning his son, it is, I think, unsafe to call into question the risen king as he sits on his throne in glory. I'm going to uh, bracket that. I just remembered we have a notes in the Peak City app um, for you if you would like to follow along, fill in the blanks, um, and have something like a, almost like a transcript of the sermon today. If you go to your app and go to more, there are notes there for you. Today I've put in some verses at the very end that can, I hope, encourage you as you walk out today. The things that we're talking about that John's talking about, from the very first verse of his letter, it's tangible. You can feel it. He heard Jesus as he walked with him. He touched his robe. He leaned beside him at the table. He probably smelled the sweat as he went from town to town. This isn't intangible, floaty, new age stuff. This isn't crystals and sage. This is real flesh in blood history that makes a difference for how you and I should live. Because if an innocent man who has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven is claimed to be God, and it is historically witnessed by over 500 people that he rose from the grave, we should take notice. If you're thinking 500 people, that's crazy. Look it up. I encourage you to look it up. Our faith is historically verifiable. Verse 11. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. As we said, the testimony is the gospel. And the gospel, the good news, it's not just inside those who believe. It's not just something that I have in my heart, I have in my mind, and it's kept there. It's the identity of of those who believe. The gospel is not just theology. The gospel is my testimony. I belong to Christ, and I am who I am, because Jesus is the great I am. 
He is the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of the entire universe. I am his, and he is mine. And that makes all the difference. This verse also teaches that the Christian lives forever. The Christian lives forever. It's not by our hard work. It's not by, I guess, the excellence of our work. It's not by our resume, although we like to build one up and say, you know, here's my list of accomplishments. We are not entitled to salvation, and we definitely don't deserve it. The Christian lives forever through faith in God who freely gave his son for us. Verse 12, and whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. It's so black and white and it's very clear. John John speaks very clearly. It's either this or that. So the question I have for you is what does it mean to have Jesus? If I were in the student ministry, they would raise their hand and respond. <laughs> They'd probably shout it out. Um, but what I think it means, I'll just give my definition. This isn't the cut and dry dictionary. What it means to have Jesus is it means you hold to him. You hold to him alone. To have Jesus means, means that you live in the truth that he has you. It doesn't depend on how tight your grasp is. You are in his hands if you have committed your life to him. It also means, I think, in daily life, you are always, as 1 Thessalonians 5 says, you are always rejoicing in every circumstance. Not only do you have joy, you are rejoicing in the good things of God. Not only do you have something to be thankful for, you are thanking God for everything he has given you in every trial, in every good season of life. And you're always talking to him. You're praying, even if it's just thank you. As we come off of Thanksgiving, have you thanked him? Do you thank him once a year, I guess is what I'm trying to say, or or do you thank him every day? It's a mark of being a Christian. It means that you have him because you know and are so personally wrapped up in the fact that what God has done, has, he has done for you. Brothers and sisters, Jesus loves you. Actually, even if you're not brother and sister, Jesus loves you. But if you are in Christ, then we have other promises. He is with you, and he is for you. Whoever has the Son has life. In our final verse in this passage today, John makes it very clear why he's written. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. But preacher, you say, what if? What if I walk out of here and immediately start sinning all over again? What if I don't feel saved? What if I don't even remember the day I was saved? What if I didn't experience a trumpet blast and the heavens opening up and the clouds tearing apart and the light shining down on me and bells ringing? What if I don't float on my way to work? What if I walked away from faith for years and I'm here in church today and I honestly could not tell you why? I have encouragement for you. In 2 Timothy 2.13, it says that if we are faithless, as we sometimes are, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God remains faithful. God is true. God upholds his end of the bargain, his end of the covenant, his end of the promise. He is faithful to his promise that if he justified you on earth, he will glorify you in heaven. It's not based on your performance. It's based on his blood. So I want to camp out at the end of this message on the three witnesses to your salvation, whether you have it or whether you don't. And I promise you at the end, if you are convinced that you are not saved, you have the opportunity to give your life to Christ. There are three witnesses. The first is the blood. 
And the blood justifies you before God when you give your life to Jesus. Justifies is a fancy word. It means that you are made right with the Almighty God, and you have no fear of condemnation on Judgment Day. He welcomes you home. The blood sets you right. The blood justifies you. The second witness is the water. The water of baptism confirms your salvation in Christ. It is an outward proclamation of what has inwardly taken place, that God has saved your soul. And the Spirit is the third. The Spirit of the living God, fully God. He abides in you as a born-again child of God. The blood justifies, the water confirms, the Spirit abides. This is the assurance test. The blood. The blood justifies. It is the blood of Jesus spilled for you. He is fully human, so he bled when he was crucified. He is fully God, so he can apply it to your soul. By grace, he applies his righteous, sinless blood to us dirty sinners, and he makes us clean before the living God. Salvation is a gift that Jesus bought with his life, but it is free, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. We only need to receive it. And those who believe in Jesus as the Son of God, as their Lord and Savior, the blood testifies on your behalf. This person, he or she, follows Christ. He or she put his faith, her faith in Jesus. The blood applies to you. The blood justifies you before God. There is now no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus, where once you were a slave to sin, now you have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the eternal kingdom of light and love and grace by the blood of the spotless lamb. The water confirms this. The waters of baptism do not save you, but oh, how good they are when you can look to them and see that they confirm what Jesus has done. Jesus, baptized in the Jordan River, was fully human and was confirmed by the Spirit and His Father to be the Son of God. When we are baptized, it is to prove that we have died to sin and we have been reborn as children of God. Paul says in Romans that the waters of baptism, this is Romans 6, wash over us like the burial of a dead person. The burial of somebody confirms that they are dead. And in this case, the waters of baptism confirm the death of the sinner. So that when we rise out of the water, we are confirmed by God to be made alive in Christ. Nothing can take your baptized status away from you. Hear me. Nothing can take that status away from you. You may forget what it felt like. You may forget the day. You may forget the details. Just because your memory goes does not mean God's memory does. God remembers the day. The day you went public with your faith, God promised to keep you and to carry you all the way home. The water confirms your salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit, the Spirit abides in the children of God. The moment you place your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit awakens you to new life, and begins to live inside of you. Guys, if you've gotten so that the Christian gospel tastes stale to you now, can you just receive the good news that God lives within you if you are in Jesus Christ? It is too good not to believe. Your body is no longer just a body, and it no longer belongs to you. It is his temple. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that he will glorify those who believe in his Son. And the evidence of the Spirit, hear me out, because the water we get, we can feel the water. The blood we get, I just gave blood yesterday, like I saw that, ew, like coming out of me, I saw it, I have it. We all have blood, we are flesh and blood people. 
the spirit sounds mm, a little too spiritual. Do I feel the spirit? Do I hear the spirit? The spirit, the evidence of him living in you, is gifts and is fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is nothing that you develop. The fruit of the Spirit means that you simply love and live for God, that you are being faithful to your part. You're praying, you're reading the Bible, you're loving people. And slowly, you will start to love like Jesus. The Spirit will transform you to start to rejoice like Jesus, to have the peace of Christ, to be patient like Jesus, and so on. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying you, another fancy word to mean that he is transforming you from the inside out to reflect the image of the Son of God. The Spirit abides in the born-again Christian. These three, te- these three witnesses, they testify for or against you, and they are all in agreement. Either you are found in Christ or you are found without him. But how good it is when the blood and the water and the Spirit can testify that you've been saved by grace through faith. And this was never a gift that you earned, and never a gift that you won. This is the gift of God, that the blood justifies you and makes you clean. The water confirms the salvation, and the Spirit lives in you. In the poetry of the beautiful hymn, It Is Well, Though Satan should buffet, and though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. When you have assurance of salvation, then you can sing the chorus of that song. It is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. You don't want me to sing. Now, assurance, even with the blood and the water and the spirit, it's still under spiritual attack by the enemy. We have one. And even if Satan feels like a little mystical out there, doesn't have anything to do with your life, there is spiritual warfare that is happening every day, battling for your soul. And if you have been saved, then Satan has no claim on you. Can I get an amen? He has no claim on you, but he wants you to doubt in the assurance of your saving grace, the blood that was applied to you, so that you go through this sorry state of affairs where you're laying the same foundation over and over and over again, and you never progress into the true joy of knowing that Christ is yours and you are His. When we lack assurance, we lack joy. Satan is real, he's a liar, and he wants you to doubt what is sure. Friends, the life of faith is not pushing a rock up a hill just for it to fall back again, just to push it up again, and just for it to fall back again. That's not what it is. It's not laying a foundation on top of another foundation and then saying, I don't know if that's foundational enough, let's do another foundation. And then, "Ah, I don't know if this looks like a house, let's do another foundation. You'll get a stack of foundations without walls, without a ceiling, Without a front door, that's not a house of faith that you can call your home. You're shivering in the cold, trying to lay the same foundation that you already know that is yours if you claim it in Christ Jesus. The author of Hebrews urges us in chapter 6 to press on, press on past the elementary doctrine of your faith into the exceeding joy of life in the Spirit. You're saved. So act like it. Saved people don't act like they've got a duty that keeps them running. Saved people live from victory. You have overcome the world, Christian. Satan wants you to think many things that are not true. He twists even Scripture, as if you know your Bible, he did with Jesus. He he twists Scripture so that it sounds like it's pointed against you even if you're in Christ. And I have read certain passages that make me doubt in the assurance of my salvation, and I'm here today just to give you a 
couple of evidences from the rest of Scripture that if Satan gives you one lie, you can take courage in the promises of God. Satan wants you to think that Jesus may not recognize you on Judgment Day. But the truth is that if you obey Christ, He knows you. Verses 1 through 3 that we read today, if you obey His commandments, you know that you love God, and those who love God are the children of God. And in addition, as He famously stated, Jesus says if you build your house on the rock of His teaching, of His Word, then when the wind and the waves come against that house, you will still stand strong, joyful, thanking God. He knows you. He knows you. If you are in Him. Satan wants you to think, I could lose my salvation at any moment, as if you and the tightness of your grip is what secures your glory in Christ. Friends, that could not be farther from the truth. You don't just lose it like you've misplaced your keys. If you abide in Christ, here's the promise, He no longer condemns you. Which means that not only does He not condemn you, He sees you as saved. You cannot lose what only God is able to give, what only God is able to keep, what only God is able to sustain. And He promises that if you abide in Him, he no longer condemns. Lastly, and I think this is the biggest one, Satan wants you to think, I've got to work, I've got to work, I've got to work. Sure, I've uh, received uh, the free gift of salvation. I've got that head knowledge, but man, do I have to work to keep my place in the kingdom of God. Nothing could be farther from the truth. If you have Christ, you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 12. If you have Christ, you have eternal life. You don't have to justify yourself if you have been justified. The blood does it all for you. And so, as we close today, I want to underscore the fact that it all depends on Jesus, not us. And I believe that even if today we live by a faith so small that we can barely see it, a faith as small as a mustard seed. Jesus is sure to grow it for his glory if we live by that small measure. I believe that nothing can separate the Christian from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And I believe that when we cling to Jesus and live by faith, it will be as it is written in Revelation. And the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth, and the angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Those who are born of God have overcome the world. So if you're saved, but you have not been baptized, I gently ask, what are you waiting for? Receive that second witness to your saving faith, to what God has already done inside of you. Now, it may be cold and brisk and a little chilly, and we may not be baptizing today, but I promise we will have baptisms in the spring, and you have plenty of time to mark your Connect card today to let your family and your friends know the date, to mark it in your calendar, and then to go through the waters of baptism to say that you are buried with Christ and you are risen again to new life in Jesus Christ. If you're saved, maybe you're baptized, but you're not living in the Spirit by faith, 
I have, I have four R words. I think I only said one of them last time. Repent is the first. It's always the first. Repent. Turn away from the things that you're doing now that are sinful. Hear me out. If you are in Christ, you are not a slave to sin any longer. You are an overcomer. You can claim the victory that Christ Jesus has for you. You have overcome the world and the devil who wants to deceive you. Second, once you repent, you reclaim the promises of God for your life. You're not coming back to salvation and you don't have to rededicate your, your life so that Christ uh, takes you into glory because he, he didn't now. It's not that easy to lose your salvation. Just reclaim the promises of God for your life. Third, ask that God will restore the joy of your salvation because salvation is worth rejoicing over. And fourth, reconnect in Christian community. Join a city group. Y'all, y'all, we say it all the time. You have friends, you have family here at Peak City Church that cannot wait to get to know you, to love you, to walk with you in good and bad times, who you will say is a second family by the end of the year. Reconnect in Christian community. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are alive to Christ. Act like it, love like it, live like it and witness to it. Finally, if you are not saved, I tell you truly, truly, there is good news for you. Today could be the best day for you today. You could have the best day of your life in this room. Jesus died in your place to save you from sin, death, and hell. And he rose again that you might live in freedom, in peace, and in the joy of an everlasting relationship with God. Would you decide to follow him today? Please do not walk away from here asking yourself, what might Christ, what might life with Christ look like? What must it feel like? You may not feel ready, friend, to give everything to God. But as we've talked about, faith is not about feelings. Even if you don't feel ready, today is the day. God is ready for you. Place your faith in Jesus Christ and you will never regret it one second of your life. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And saints, as we do so, would you lift up those who are on the fence of faith? Could you pray for God to save somebody this morning? If you're here or online and you have not decided to follow Jesus but would like to start living with him, would you just simply raise your hand? That's all that's required to say that I am deciding to follow Jesus for the first time. If you raise your hand, I will know to pray for you. I'll know to celebrate you. We'll know to gather around you. No one's looking. I mean, I am, but... If you raise your hand, you're, you're saying, I commit to live for Jesus. If you're online or in this room, I would like to lead you in a prayer of saving grace. If you would just repeat after me in your heart or out loud, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I believe you are Lord in heaven. I ask, take this cold, dead spirit out of me and give me your Holy Spirit. I turn from my old life and I live for you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For anyone who prayed that prayer for the first time online or in person, can we just give a big celebration of life? It is the best decision you will ever make. If you said yes to Jesus online, you can text yes to 919-289-9278, and we will follow up with you about your next steps. 
You can also mark your connect card in the place that says, I made a decision to follow Jesus, and we will follow up with you. Man, we're so ready to be your family, your, your friends, the people who will celebrate you day after day. And the decision you made, you will never regret. As we give, as we prepare to worship with one last song, uh, I would like to take up an offering if the ushers would come forth to take that up. First time guests, please don't feel obligated to give in our offering today. In fact, we have a gift for you. If this is the first time you're, you're here with us, it's just a little gift card, just something to say, we love you. We're so glad that you came here today. For everyone else, let's give cheerfully and let's worship together with our giving. Let's pray over this offering. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for giving yourself, for giving more than we knew we needed and more than enough. We thank you that you did not spare anything in saving us from ourselves. And we thank you so much that whatever offering we bring, we can use it for the glory of your everlasting kingdom to make an eternal impact in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would stand up as the basket passes, we will worship together. It's Thanksgiving weekend. A lot of folks have come home to visit with family and friends, and we're so glad that you're here today as we worship the Lord together. We're gonna sing a song, and it's a beautiful picture about what happens to the believer when we say yes to Jesus. Everything that Austin talked about today, when we allow the blood of Jesus to be applied to our life, heaven is ours. And this is just a little picture of eternity. I think we might have gotten away from singing about these songs of heaven. We used to sing about them all the time, and I know you can hear them in your head and in your heart, Here's a new one that's singing about that today. Let's lift our voices in thanks to God for what he has done. Amen. Come on. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your bread and I've sang my own song.
a wide open tomb where there should be. Thank you, Lord. Come on, sing it out. In life, the Father is work. Sing it, church. Roses in blood pushed up from the edge. The rivers of tears flow from good times. Remember, the families are singing. so good to us and we're so thankful that we can be in your presence we're so thankful for the promise of heaven beyond anything we're thankful for Jesus we're thankful for the precious blood that he shed that removes the sins of this world for whosoever would believe I believe Lord I believe in what you've done for me and in this cloud of witnesses here even today we confess we believe Lord Jesus heaven is ours only because of what you have done thank you for your life that you gave for us thank you for your glorious resurrection Lord I know the words are true when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we will sing and we will shout the victory God let it be as we leave and we go out into this world that people see a reflection of who you are in us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hey, go out and be the church this week. Let someone see Christ within you. Let them see the change, the mark of the Savior on you by the things that you do, and the actions that you perform in front of others. Oh, that they might see those good works and glorify our Father that is in heaven. You are sent to go and be God's church. God bless you. We can't wait to see you next week. And Merry Christmas, y'all. Merry Christmas.